Okay, great. Well, um, welcome everybody. I'm very pleased today to have uh, Carola Bibian Schoen Lieb, um, who's a professor of applied mathematics uh, in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at Cambridge, uh, with us here today virtually, of course. Um, Carol is head of the Cambridge Image Analysis Group, um, director of the Cantab Capital Institute of Mathematics for Information, um, and a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute in London, among you know, numerous other hosts. And uh, her research is in inverse problems, imaging, uh, partial differential equations, and optimal transport, really a wide range of things um, for applications in image analysis, image processing, um, and other inverse problems. And, and I think we'll, we'll hear a lot about it today, but Carola's had a you know, wide and kind of fascinating range of collaborations with people in these fields, ranging from biologists and, and clinicians who do biomedical imaging to art restorers. And uh, some of her work has been exhibited in, uh, I think, the Fitzwilliam Museum at Cambridge, um, which is which is pretty cool. And I think not many mathematicians can say that. Um, and along the way, Carl has won, uh, you know, host of very you know, prestigious prizes: the, the the Whitehead Prize from the London Mathematical Society, and most recently the Calderon Prize um, for um, outstanding contributions to the field of inverse problems. Um, so we're really pleased to have with her to have her with us today, and uh, we'll let you take it away, Carla. Thank you very much, Yusuf. One of the nicest introductions I've ever had, I think. Uh, also because I really, really love interdisciplinary work. So the Fitzwilliam piece is, is something very close to my heart. So thank you. Okay, but actually today I'm talking more about math, if that's okay. Um, so, um, and what I would like to um, investigate with you is the idea that has arisen maybe in the last two years or so, three years, um, to use more data-driven methods to solve inverse problems like deep neural networks. Um, okay, so let's, uh, so let's just dive into this idea. Uh, so a few words, Yusuf, you said already everything, so maybe I'll just skip that. I'll just show you uh, very briefly the very uh, nice, happy faces uh, behind a lot of the work that I'm going to present and a lot of the fun that I had in the last years um, working um, on the stuff that I'm going to present to you. So this is a really, really, really nice group of people I'm collaborating with here. Um, and here I'm only showing you the mathematicians, not even the, all the interdisciplinary collaborators. And then, of course, I also need to say um, thanks to all the funders who are funding our research, from government funding to private trust funding to um, industrial partners that we have. So what do we do? Uh, so by the way, Cambridge Image Analysis Group, I don't know if I should maybe even say this in the US, but the reason why we named ourselves like this was that it has a nice abbreviation. And this was not my invention, was actually the invention of my first postdoc. So, th so, that's, so that's the reason why we called ourselves like this. But it also has to do with the content. So we develop um, mathematical techniques that range from PDEs, from variational regularization models, which come more from, from kind of functional analysis ideas to optimization. And lately, maybe really in the last three years or so, uh, also involving more and more machine learning ideas to solve all kinds of uh, inverse problems, image analysis, image processing problems ranging from image reconstruction from indirect measurements like they happen in tomography uh, to image restoration, segmentation and classification to time dependent uh, image analysis like motion estimation and object tracking. And all of this very closely linked usually to real world applications ranging from photography, remote sensing, biomedical imaging, art restoration that uh, Yusuf also mentioned, uh, forensics, material science, lots of different things. Okay, so what about this talk today? So the main messages, I always feel actually it's useful for myself and maybe also for the audience uh, to know what, what I want to tell you, to remind myself also what I want to tell you. So the main messages of this talk are that I believe deep learning really offers very interesting opportunities for inverse problems um, because of two reasons, basically. One is, and this is something that we have seen in many of the success stories of deep learning in various different areas, that they have the potential to just really 
produce very, very high quality, highly accurate solutions. So this, this is actually what I want to say here, highly accurate solutions. Um, and the other one is, and this is in particular hitting us who are working with very large data and also you, with usually very non-linear models that we need to solve. Once these networks are trained, they're super cheap. Um, and that's another, um, you know, attract a, a attraction factor, let's say, that these um, neural networks have. Why this is interesting, why this is more, let's say, than just applying deep learning to inverse problems is that they don't usually work off the shelf for the kind of problems that we want to solve. Where the kind of problems that we want to solve are ill-posed usually and don't have the luxury of being provided with lots of training data lots of representative training data for lots of different scenarios that can happen with the kind of things we're interested in so the, they really only work in practice and this makes this also interesting when we combine them in appropriate ways with mathematical and statistical modeling really with the kind of things that we have been educated with that we, our experience you know that we have experience with and that we know um that we know something about also Okay, so before going um, to the core of the talk, which is this deep learning for inverse problems, my plan is to briefly uh, tell you the kind of inverse problems that I'm focusing on in this presentation, then give you a rough idea of how mathematicians, statisticians are usually solving these types of inverse problems and narrow this down to the subclass of inverse problem solutions that I've been working on in particular uh, on in the last couple of years, which are these variational regularization approaches, and then go to deep learning, this idea of uh, using deep learning for inverse problems, in particular in the context of using the neural network as a regularization uh, in order to regularize the problem that we want to solve. And then I show you one uh, thing that uh, we did um, about two years ago and that we had a, actually a kind of update on recently, which is this idea of learning a regularizer and a variational approach. Okay, so, um, right, so the type of inverse problems that I'm talking about here are inverse imaging problems where the data the measurements that you take and the image that you want to extract from these measurements are usually related to some kind of physical process. And this physical process I can model with a linear or nonlinear operator, which is maybe it's e always easier to start with an equation, which is this capital T here. Okay, so many of you know this anyway, this is mainly to fix, not fix notation, also give you a flavor of the kind of operators T that we can think of um, are behind this talk. And usually in inverse problems, T can be some, tr some linear transform, could be uh, a PDE, yeah, could be some other integral operator, could be many different things. Yeah? So, um, so this is basically why is my data. U is, in most of the things I'm showing you, U is an image I want to reconstruct from the data. Uh, and then capital T is this physical process, which brings you from um, the image to the data, which explains the data. And little n here, I just put as a random, not, as, a, as a generic notation for any random corruptions that are, that are, in, the, that are in the data. Okay, and I also now just to fix everything here, um, I'm thinking of, both the data and the image living in some norm vector spaces that usually end up being some one-off spaces. Okay, um, so the special thing about the type of inverse imaging problems that we are looking at here, for instance, are that the measurements and the image that you want to reconstruct live in very different spaces. Okay, and this is the case when this capital T is a transform when 
uh, the, also when we say that an image is indirectly given by the data. So the, these are indirect measurements of the image. Um, and this is the example here of X-ray uh, tomography of uh, computer tomography, where um, what you see here um, are basically um, accumulations of uh, the x of the x rays energy attenuation when it travels through the body at different at different angles and at different uh, at different um, different y intercepts let's say of these lines that are shot through you uh, yeah these rays that are shot through you and what you measure is basically you can think of after some transformations happening you can think of as um, the line integrals of the uh, density that has given rise to the attenuation of the x-rays while they go through your body very roughly speaking so what you want to do is um, is from um, the line integrals of this tissue density through um, line integrals taken through uh, around different angles and different locations you want to reconstruct the, the, the density itself okay and this is also this capital t is also called the radon transform or x-ray transform and um yeah and usually the challenge is that um, you have noisy measurements and the challenge is also that this radon transform is a compact operator um, that doesn't like so much the uh, inversion done to it <laughs> so it will get there in a moment Okay, so this is the task um, to go from right to left. Now, there's, there are tons of inverse problems in imaging out there. We have just seen uh, the inverse problem behind CT. Um, so medical imaging is a huge resource for inverse problems. Uh, inverse problems also appear, this type of inverse problems in non-destructive testing. Um, of course, inverse problems appear in all kinds of places, but I'm focusing here mainly on imaging. So computer vision is another one where this forward operator T is not, might actually not be so explicitly given or is actually not that so explicitly, you know, you can't write it down that explicitly, but the inverse problem here is you have, let's say a 2D projection of a 3D scene and you want to identify different objects to do a, a segmentation and classification. Um, from that um, happens in, in remote sensing. So when you want to understand the constitution, the, the composition of the ground, but you want to do that at scale, you want to do that uh, from, an, from an airplane or from a satellite to take pictures from above, and then you want to understand what the composition is. And so, so, so LIDAR and radar and all these kind of things you can do or hyperspectral imaging, okay. Okay, so this is so this is uh, roughly a motivation, and as I said at the very beginning, the the issue with most of the inverse problems that are out there is that they are ill-posed, and the reasons for that um, are that um, the inverse of these operators capital T are usually unbounded or discontinuous, and examples are compact forward operators with infinite range. Um, reasons also in practice you know even for instance if you think about magnetic resonance tomography you have the Fourier transform this is a kind of very nicely behaved operator actually but uh, here the problem is that uh, you you usually have, always have undersampled data you don't you usually never sample as much Fourier coefficients as you would need for the resolution of the image that you want to reconstruct uh, and that it just has to do with time that the acquisition takes related to the number of Fourier coefficients acquired. Anyway, so you have underdetermined data as well, and then you have noise. And so all of this kind of together um, results in inversions being, you know, unbounded, instabilities occurring. So solutions are not continuously depending on the input data, non-uniqueness, and so on. So these are usually the consequences of this, uh, of this kind of problem. And here, I'm not going to explain this. It's maybe self-explanatory. This is just a visualization of this underdeterminedness. Yeah? So going from one direction to the other is easy, but the inverse problem is usually not so easy. Yeah? 
because it's you don't have enough information. So how do people go around this? Um, and there are various different approaches here. Um, the main one that I have experience with is the first bullet point, which is this functional analytic inversion approaches. Um, and then there is also a huge group, um, I'm guessing that is also mainly the audience today, in fact, <laughs> um, which, which are more from the statistical, statistical community, looking at um, not reconstructing a single, you know, not, not saying I want to, to, to compute a, a solution to the problem, but I want to compute um, uh, a distribution of solutions with different uh, with different probabilities and then compute estimators from that, which links this, by the way, back again to the kind of functional analytic inversion approaches. I'll comment on this in a moment. So, um, so functional analytic inversion also ranges, you know, various different types of approaches have been, uh, have been proposed here. The one thing that I want to focus on, because this is also the one that I'm linking the deep learning into later on, is this variational regularization approach. Okay, so what's the idea here? I'm going back to this equation. Okay, why is my data? U is the quantity that I want to reconstruct an image. Um, and so we've just, um, um, we've just seen that this is usually not so easy because uh, these problems are ill-posed. So, so one, one way around this um, is, well, one way, one way, that mathematicians do if, if you have a very complicated problem or if you have in this, indeed a problem that in this case is ill-posed, you try to find a good uh, proxy, let's say, of this originally kind of very hard problem that makes it this well-posed. And so in this case, the proxy is that um, you add more information. On the one hand, you add more information to the problem apart from this um, model of how the data and the quantity u, the image, are related to each other. You add information about the type of use you want to compute. And this comes in form of a regularity assumption. This is also why it's called variational regularization. And this regularity assumption uh, is put together with this forward model equation in terms of an energy minimization problem. Okay, so this is what you have here. So instead of attempting to solve this equation directly, we compute um, an approximation to the true solution as a minimizer of um, a functional, an energy functional, that on the one hand asks the minimizer or a minimizer, doesn't need to be uh, unique, to be close uh, in terms of the forward operator to the data. So we want that U explains the data, which models this equation here. And this is quantified with some kind of norm or some metric or discrepancy term or something like that, uh, that captures um, the, the difference between the data and uh, the forward model. And then you add this regularization, which boils down the type of solutions you compute of this equation to a, to a subclass in which the problem is now well posed, in which you can actually compute a minimizer and you can, you can, uh, you can show uh, existence, um, sometimes uniqueness, uh, actually for the kind of problems that, that I'm showing you, mostly not. Um, uh, but you can also show uh, certain regularity assumptions on you and uh, and and so on, and you get uh, also continuous uh, dependence on the data and so on and so forth. Yeah, so these kind of things you get from these approaches, which is nice. So you've turned that into an almost well-posed approach, modulo uniqueness, let's say. So, and then depending on how ill-posed the problem is. You, uh, you weight this regularization against this data fidelity term, uh, and this is this little parameter alpha here. Okay, so this is something you choose or you have a way of choosing it. Um, so a typical example of a, this data fidelity term is an L2 squared fit. Um, a typical example in 
inverse problems in imaging uh, for regularization is um, the, the so-called total variation, um, which uh, thinking about this in a finite dimensional space, okay, finite dimensional data, finite dimensional image you are reconstructing, you can also think for those who, who, um, uh, who have experience in compressed sensing um, or sparsity promoting regularization in general, this is a sparsity promoting regularization, okay? You're looking for use which have a sparse gradient uh, with the L1 norm pro promoting sparsity or again being a good proxy for sparsity. Uh, so what you're really looking for when you use a regularization like this are, are reconstruction images which are piecewise constant, right? The gradient of view is zero in almost all places, just non-zero in a few characteristic places. And these characteristic places are edges. And uh, as simple as this type of regularization is, it has actually had a huge, huge, huge influence on a lot of different fields and had actually uh, really made a step change for inverse imaging problems in comparison to what has been done before. Uh, really because in a lot of inverse imaging problems, you're not really interested in looking at only pretty pictures, but you want to quantify information in them. And here edges are really super important in many different fields. Okay, sorry, I've talked too much to this slide. Let me show you uh, even another slide with more words, sorry. So one thing that this should just emphasize is that um, the total variation is one type of regularization that is being used in, 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 uh, in inverse problems. Many, many applied mathematicians throughout uh, the last 20 years or so, or even, or even longer, have been thinking about what is a good prior, what is a good regularizer for images. And so many of you know things that came out of applied harmonic analysis, like wavelets and all kinds of lets. Uh, also other types of norms have been used, Sobolev norms, Bessov norms. Um, the total variation has also been generalized uh, to all kinds of uh, different, uh, in all kinds of different directions, to higher differential orders, to anisotropic versions, to non-local versions, and so on and so forth. So there is a huge, huge zoo of regularizers. And one thing I should have, I should have said actually before, because I promised, is that this, of course, can also lead back to uh, to uh, to uh, to a Bayesian setting. Uh, that um, in some cases, this can be interpreted as a map estimator of a posterior distribution, where this regularizer. Here is uh, is the negative log of a prior uh, of a of a Gibbs prior, and then this uh, data discrepancy term uh, is uh, the negative log of the likelihood. Yeah, so it, it, this doesn't always work, but works often. At least conceptually, we can also think of it like this. Okay, so the whole idea of all these this really huge effort in the community. Um, of these variational methods and so on is really that um, images or solutions to inverse problems can often be very, very well described by just a few relevant features, which goes back again to the sparsity assumption and goes back now a few relevant features with certain geometric properties like edges, for instance, are important. Yeah, And this link, links this back to total variation, and by the way, also links it back to uh, PDEs that also have, have played a huge, huge role uh, in image processing over many years. Uh, just think about the PDE that you would get if you write down the associated euler lagrange equation uh, to this, uh, to such a minimization problem. And it has an effect, okay? So this is just a very, a, a super baby slide, super baby example, let's say, of uh, showing you that what the effect is. This goes back to CT. So this is all simulated, and I'm only showing you the images. I'm sure not showing you the data. So this is the, this is the ground truth uh, here. And here we have, uh, or Shubo actually has uh, simulated um, some sparse angle, low dose measurements. So noisy and not very many angle measurements, uh, and then reconstructed an image from it. And what you see here is, um, a reconstructed image with the so-called filtered back projection. So filtered back projection, you could think of one of the uh, most direct 
approaches to trying to do inversion based on my forward operator equation, which basically tries to solve a least squares problem, uh, you know, this tu minus, minus y with a minimal norm constraint, very roughly speaking. You can think of this is what is also called a pseudo inverse. So this is the type of thing you get with almost no regularization, okay? Now, if you do variational regularization with a total variation, you get something like this. Okay, so let me go back and forth for a second, because I think for people who have seen this before is super non-impressive, but for people who have not seen this before, I think this is actually quite impressive. So, okay, let's go back again. This is filter back projection. This is the total variation. Now, if you look into the zoomed area, yeah, so what the, the total variation is somehow doing is it's boiling things down to what is more or less essential, right? So it's kind of looking into these kind of blobs here. So it, it's trying to get rid of lots of stuff that you might actually not want to be looking at. Okay, so that's, that's why you introduce prior assumption, okay? So this is really important to understand that these inverse problems, depending on how you solve them, how you regularize them, you get very different solutions. Okay, and so this regularizer is also really important, right? So this is quite important. And again, the total variation has been very successful and it's brothers and sisters as well. But these are all limited, of course, by our ability of what we can model. Yeah? So, so um, I mean, even when I said this before, total variation models, roughly speaking, that an image is piecewise constant, many of you might have thought, uh, I mean, images are not piecewise constant, right? So this is already a super simplification. So what about this idea now of trying to make this regularization or this choice of this regularization more data driven? Okay, so this is what I'm going to show you now. Okay, so uh, apart from deep learning, of course, this idea of uh, making regularization data driven is not new. And here I'm showing you just a few examples. That, by the way, mainly came from the signal processing um, signal processing community, actually more than from the inverse problems community. So here, uh, one example is uh, sparse coding and dictionary learning. So here the idea is, again, I have a variational problem like we saw it before. Um, we have the state of discrepancy term and we have the regularizer, but now what I'm saying is, um, I, I'm saying that the solution U, okay, that I want to compute of, uh, uh, of this inverse problem can be represented as a linear combination of elements phi i, of uh, dictionary elements phi i uh, with coefficients gamma i. And what I want is again this sparsity assumption that this uh, representation is sparse, okay? So that this um, vector of uh, coefficients gamma is, is has a small L1 norm. Mm. Okay, so this is not new. We have seen this before. What is new is that you can also make, apart from, in this case, computing the gammas, which then if the phi i's would be given, would determine your solution. You can also make the dictionary elements themselves an unknown, which means actually you don't know, you, you're learning the regularization itself, right? You don't know in which type of spaces the uh, solution is sparse. Um, another idea of learning the regularizer is this black box denoiser idea or plug and play prior or regularization by denoising or you know, the different instances of this. Um, where this idea, by the way, has won two prizes in the Siam uh, Imaging Activity Group this year. Um, the, both the most influential paper idea and also the, uh, the early career uh, prize. So one got, went to Romano and one to uh, Bowman. So uh, this, ha this had an effect, let's say. But anyway, so uh, here the idea is, again, I'm. I'm phrasing the solution to my inverse problem as a minimization problem. But now I'm uh, formulating the regularizer I, I, Yeah, in terms of this kind of inner product structure. I don't have time to explain exactly why it looks like this. But the important thing is that the regularizer is characterized by this lambda here, 
which is your most favorite denoiser, which doesn't have, need to do need to have anything to do with the with the inverse problem you want to solve. This can be that's why it's called black box denoiser. So you can take any kind of denoiser that you know BM3D or whatever and just use it in this context. There are some theoretical problems if you don't use the, the denoiser with the right uh, properties, but that's again another story. But this is another thing that people have been thinking about and it has been very successful, gave really good results. Um, one thing that I think I might have actually promised in my abstract to talk about, but then I thought I don't have enough time to do that, um, is this idea of uh, bi-level optimization, where you what you do, so, so this is already a kind of an instance of, um, uh, of, a, of a supervised, let's say, machine learning problem, where you, here I have my variational problem, and I have my regularizer, and now I parameterize my regularizer in whatever way, okay? So what we did uh, in the works that we have done, we actually looked at very, very low level parameterization of total variation type regularizers, like, informal convolutions of different types of L1 priors with different types of sparsity uh, operators. Um, yeah, so things like this, uh, but you can do whatever, you, you know, you can, you, you, you can be quite general here. So actually Irene von Secker has looked a lot uh, at the analysis of these type of approaches as well and has actually formulated this very, very generally. But so the idea is now, that you want to find a good parameterization lambda of your regularizer, uh, good um, with respect to some uh, optimality criterion that is here a loss function capital F that could be just uh, determined by a training set. So let's say that you have a training set of measurements and associated ground truth um, images and you, you find a good parameterization of this regularizer by minimizing uh, a supervised loss for this training set. This could be one example. Okay, but this is again, very low level uh, actually uh, in practice. Um, and yeah, so um, another idea uh, that now I want to discuss with you is this idea of going a bit crazy and trying to do a super, super over parameterization like with deep neural networks. And so one thing uh, that is a, like a, a health and safety warning is that while this slide is still has mostly mathematical theory behind, now if I turn the page, this will change. <laughs> so anyway, so deep learning for inverse problems. So, there, so how have people thought about how to solve inverse problems with neural networks. So here I'm just giving you some references, mainly the slide is for people who want to look at this later and want to look at some of the papers. And also this is also not up to date. There, there are lots of recent also works. Like yesterday there was actually a talk in the Minds uh, seminar by Reinhard um, Heckel, I think, who, uh, who has been looking at um, untrained CNNs for image recovery and even could give some recovery guarantees and stuff like this. So, 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 okay. So th there is still lots of stuff going on is what I want to say. So it's not totally complete this uh, list here, um, but it gives you the main categories. Um, and so let me quickly talk you through these main categories. Okay, so the, 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 the one uh, idea that was one of the first papers that came out in this context is this idea, or the one of the first ideas came out of this, it was this idea of fully learned models. Okay, so this is what I said at the beginning, this brute force approach to throw a neural network onto an inverse problem actually doesn't work. It is not totally true what I said, but it is true to a certain extent. So, so here the idea is that you have your, your, your problem you want to solve. In this case, uh, in this particular paper, this was MRI. And what you do is you train uh, a neural network end to end. Okay, so, so, so you, 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 you input the data and then out comes an image. So the issue here is that 
these networks, as you can imagine, so thinking about Fourier transform or Radon transform, these global operators, they are huge. <laughs> so these are not just CNNs also. They need, uh, for instance, for modeling the Fourier transform, they need a couple of dense layers and stuff like this. So this becomes really, really tough. These models are just very unmanageable and also in my perspective, as impressive as it is that this works, yeah. So, 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 so in this paper, they could show that 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 they can actually train a neural network to do the uh, to do the reconstruction without inputting any explicit knowledge that there is a Fourier transform in between the data and the image. So, I I think that's super impressive. But it, it had all has all kinds of problems, yeah. So, so it only works for small problems because of this dense layers, uh, and um, uh, also you, uh, it, it's not very generalizable, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is, uh, and seems a bit unnecessary because we know something, so we shouldn't throw it away. Okay, so the other idea was learned post processing, where you say, I mean, one of the issues of the first approach is that you need to do something very costly to model this transition from one function space to another function space, right? This is what I said before, these indirect imaging, you, your measurements live in a very different space to um, the actual image. So in learned post-processing, the idea is you do a super simple inversion at the beginning, like this filtered back projection, and then you use a CNN, and then, for instance, in this case of uh, this paper by Unser and co-authors, they use a UNET to then clean up all the noise, to do the regularization, but as an after effect. Yeah? So, so to do the regularization um, against the noise and also these, these artifacts, for instance, that you get from CT and so on. Okay, so this is another thing. Um, then there are these approaches. Actually, maybe I should switch the slide because I have some equations that make this maybe a bit clearer. Okay, so so I don't have uh, uh, an equation for the for the fully learned thing because that I think everyone can imagine this is just measurements, neural network output, right? So the, this is but uh, with the post processing, the idea is you have your data, you apply a pseudo inverse to it, like filter back projection. And then you have a neural network, which I hear uh, denote by psi, theta, theta are the parameters that characterize this neural network that should then give you your reconstruction, okay? Now, learned iterative reconstruction, and there are various instances of learned iterative reconstruction coming out of Ozan Oktem's group, coming out of uh, Tom Pock's group, for instance. Um, yeah, I'm, so, I'm sure I forget people, but there, um, for instance, Rebecca Willard also has been working on this. So the idea here is that you intertwine the information of the forward operator into the network, roughly speaking. So, or in other words, uh, you set up, so think about how you would solve a variational approach, right? So, so you have your variational problem and then you set up some iterative scheme numerically to minimize this functional. Um, and so if you think about the simplest one, you like gradient descent, for instance, uh, what you would get um, is somehow um, uh, un plus one equals un plus uh, delta t times the negative gradient of your energy functional. Yeah? So here it's doing something similar, but every gradient step is now potentially given by a different neural network. And also you don't iterate till convergence because there is in this sense, no converge, uh, convergence because you are now actually away from the variational approach because you're changing what you're doing in each step. You're changing your energy function in each, in each step, but you solve it for let's say 10 iterations or something like this. And now each iteration is given by a neural network. And this neural network kind of has two channels. So it, it kind of sees two things. It sees both the image, but it also sees the data. Yeah, so, so and they are talking to each other through this forward operator. So, so I, I don't, ex I want to get to my variational regularization approach. That's why I'm speeding up here now, but okay. So this is, this is one idea. Okay, so the issues with all of this is there are, 
practically almost no theoretical underpinnings. And this is always a bit worrying, of course, because you know, one thing we have been working very hard in inverse problems was to 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 get to a model that is well posed. And here I'm mainly talking about instabilities. Also, the interpretation of a reconstruction model is 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 missing or is only asymptotically. Okay, so asymptotically, people can say something about these learned iterative schemes. Um, and data consistency if i say data consistency is not guaranteed it's not it's not totally true but let's say in, in most of these cases it's not so easy to guarantee it so that the solution actually really explains the data um and then maybe i'll skip that because that's too blunt maybe but we we anyway know that there are issues with deep learning okay so let me show you the third class which is the class and let me show you one example of this third class of going back to variational regularization and then learning a regularizer. Okay, so this is now the idea here. Okay, and the idea here really is, um, okay, so first of all, so, 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 so I mean, just reminding ourselves wh where we are kind of. Yeah? So we, as a starting point, we have a really a rich, a rich range of mathematical image processing models sourced from PDEs, variational calculus, functional analysis, numerical analysis, optimization, and so on and so forth, that come with mathematical guarantees, interpretability, agnostic to the data set. Okay, they're of course quite very generalizable, um, but they have a limit of course. Okay, so this is also always the kind of uh, interplay between generalizability and expressibility because in a way um yeah would be super if we can bring them optimally together but it's very challenging um and so the idea that that i want to promote is that we use learning now to only complement what we can so 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 to really complement what we cannot so to come so we 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 can model a, a particular part of this inverse problem and another part we are really crap in like this regularization and this is something i want to change i don't want to change the whole thing i want to change a part of it okay and this is just to say of course if i have infinite amounts of data i can do everything i want but i don't okay let me also skip over this i think the previous slide made this already clear and so with this variational regularization idea what i really want is i don't want to learn how to reconstruct from the from the data but i want to learn what good prior assumptions i could use in the reconstruction um, to do a better job okay and this is joint work with a couple of people so this is uh joint work with my almost finishing PhD student, uh, Sebastian. Um, then I, the people in red, by the way, I didn't find pictures of, so uh, I'm sorry. So Søren Dittmar is, is actually now also finishing a PhD student of Peter Maas. Uh, Shubo uh, has just started with me uh, and is a former postdoc of uh, Ozan and Ozan is also a col uh, collaborator in this project, Ozan Ekta from KTH. And uh, Zach has been a super talented undergraduate student who has been working with us last summer after one year of mathematics. I mean, this was really super impressive. And yeah, anyway, so that's the team. And maybe I should say the main players, I mean, maybe the main contributors in this are really Sebastian, who are, with whom we have written this first paper which was my first machine learning paper, which was very exciting. Actually, I didn't go to the conference, but still it was exciting to listen to what Sebastian was telling me. And then uh, Shubo, who has been the main collaborator in trying to make what we did in the first paper convex. Convexity is kind of always nice to have. Okay, so here the idea is I'm going back to my variational problem um, with the idea, with all the advantages in mind of having an explicit uh, characterization of the forward model. Okay, um, so my, my forward operator is very explicitly in there. Um, 
this quantification, depending on how I choose this norm, might also tell me something about the distribution of the data. So I can also put in some modeling assumptions about that. Um, I have my regularizer here. Uh, and I, whatever I do now, I can at least try to interpret it as, as, as some kind of regularization. Um, yeah, and that's, that's more or less it. Yeah? So, so these, are, these are all the, and of course it's a variational problem. Uh, and if I don't screw up things too much, I might still be able to prove something about this. And this is something I'll show you in a moment. Okay. So, but how do we, so the idea now is that we want to train, we want to now uh, find a good strategy to train such a regularizer. Okay. And this is where this idea of the adversarial regularizer comes in, because we want to train the regularizer in, in an adversarial fashion. So this is roughly the idea. So on the one hand, and this is not heuristics, on the one hand, we want to train the regularizer to suppress characteristic noise, where with characteristic noise, I mean, okay, noise in the data, but then also the type of artifacts that I get from the ill postness of the forward operator, like in, uh, in CT with uh, the Radon transform, these streak artifacts, or with MRI, these aliasing artifacts and stuff like this, okay? Um, and I want to do, the, I, I want to train the regularizer to suppress this by showing it a lot of images that have these type of artifacts noise. So I want the regularizer on the one hand to be large, right? So, so, so just go back here. So uh, a, a desirable solution U is one for which the regularizer is small. I'm minimizing it, right? So the undesirable ones should be the ones where the regularizer is large. And then the desirable ones should be the ones for which the regularizer is small. And so I, what I, I'm doing now is I, I construct two distributions. I have one distribution uh, PR that I call here the distribution of ground truth images. Okay, so these are images that are prototypes of the type of solutions I want this regularizer to favor. And then I have another distribution that I call here, let's go here, PN, which I get by applying the pseudo inverse to a set of data that I have. Okay. Um, where again, think going back to the pseudo inverse, this for instance, filtered back projection. Okay, this shows me nicely the problems with the inversion of this, of this forward operator T. So in pictures, I have two distributions. Here actually I'm showing you three distributions, but the main ones are the left and the right one. The left one is the distribution of ground truth images. In this case, I, we, we have been looking at CT. So this is from an open lung CT database. Um, so the, these are the CT images. And then uh, I'm from these CT images, I'm simulating uh, low dose uh, and uh, sparse angle measurements. And from these measurements, I then construct uh, by applying filter back projection, these uh, images in the distribution PN. So the, the right images are the ones that the regularizer in this adversarial manner. Okay, so, and how do I do this? So what's the good, what's the, example of a loss function that I could use to do this, right? So the idea is how do I incorporate in the loss function what I just said? And uh, maybe I'll just uh, tell you here what is here at the bottom because this relation with the Wasserstein distance is actually kind of interesting, but maybe not uh, so essential at the moment. Um, the idea here is that as a loss function, I'm uh, using um, the difference of the regularizer evaluated for images coming from this distribution PN and uh, of uh, images coming from this distribution PR, okay? So what I want is that on average, the regularizer, which the regularizer will be now an argument, will be the optimal argument, will be a maximizer, sorry, of this difference here. Yeah? 
a one Lipschitz um, a one Lipschitz regularizer, which will come in handy, not just because I have this uh, this connection with the Wasserstein distance, but it will come in handy also uh, the moment I want to show something about um, the F star, the optimal regularizer that comes out um, for proving existence and so on and stability for the regularizer I'm getting. So I'm training it in this adversarial fashion, okay? Small for the nice images, large for the images that uh, I've screwed up. Okay, let me skip this. Uh, we can prove a few things about it. Um, just thinking about the time, I'm skipping this. But uh, let me show you how we do this. So the idea, of course, is now I'm not going to optimize here over all one Lipschitz functions to find a good regularizer. What I'm doing is, and this is where the neural networks come in, I'm parametrizing F by a neural network. Okay, so this is the idea. Um, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm doing some tricks, but it doesn't matter. The main thing maybe to, to appreciate is that this neural network is now taking an image, right? So this psi theta should replace through this regularizer R, right? So it should take an image of a particular size and it spits out a, a real value that is small for the type of images we want and is large for the type of images we don't want. Okay, and this, by the way, is also motivated to this. You, you might have seen before in these Wasserstein gun papers um, where people have been using these type of loss functions. Okay, and once we have trained this regularizer with these two distributions, we can plug it back into the variational problem and go away and be happy, okay, and use it. Okay, so what does it give? So let me show you a few examples, and I think maybe it's best to, so again, these are the measurements, um, and now I'm showing you different, this is the ground truth, and now I'm showing you different reconstructions. So let me just go uh, to the, to an example where we can zoom in a little bit. Okay, this is the ground truth. This is the result we get with this adversarial regularizer idea. This is, so now I'm keeping this here, by the way, on the, on the right, and I'm changing, instead of the ground truth, I'm showing you now different reconstructions. This is filtered back projection, and this is the total variation. Okay, so, yeah, I know, it's kind of, Nice, in a way. So I'm here comparing only with variational regularization approaches and with the filter back projection. I'm not comparing with post-processing, visually at least. Uh, it looks For post-processing, it looks very, very similar, by the way. Um, or with these learned iterative reconstructions. Um, just because it is not, they are not very comparable in the sense that uh, the adversarial regularizer actually is trained not in a supervised fashion. Maybe this is also something important to understand because we are, the loss function acts on distributions. It doesn't act on pairs of data and reconstruction and ground truth. So we don't need paired training data. That's another important thing to know. And that's also why in a way they can't quality wise, can't reach supervised methods. Yeah, this is an unsupervised uh, approach. The nice thing is because it's a regularizing, because it's a variational problem, we have it somehow under control um, in the sense that we can prove existence and at least in a weak sense, we can prove stability. We have made this all a bit stronger with, together with Shubo recently, where we looked at a convex learned adversarial regularizer and that of course as you can imagine gives you stronger guarantees anyway so takeaway messages um i really think that this idea of using these over parameterized models for for inverse problems in combination with thorough mathematical statistical modeling in whatever way you know, is possible, has a, has a lot of potential. I've shown you mainly this variational regularization approaches because these are the ones, at least currently, that we can still say something mathematically about. Uh, the, the others, uh, people are starting to be able to prove things, but it's, it, it, it's, it's a bit slower. Um, okay, so these hybrid methods, I think, have a lot of future. 
there are lots of open questions. Um, how do we get stronger constraints, stronger guarantees? How do we uh, also make these regularizers more interpretable? I mean, maybe this is even a contradiction in itself because the total variation is super interpretable, but also in its assumptions in that body cam model also simple. So this is, is always a bit of a trade off here. Um, also, what are we optimizing for? Okay, so so we are optimizing now for good, you know, for good looking images. But as I said, actually, at the very beginning as well, in inverse problems, rarely we are, we are reconstructing for a good looking image, but we are reconstructing for doing a quantification in an image. So this is also something we, have, we are looking at actually in a project with radiologists uh, to make these learned inversions. Um, task driven rather than beauty driven uh okay and then there are lots of other things but i yeah i thank you very much for your attention and yeah i'm happy to take any questions thanks carola i think uh we have time for maybe for just a, sh a very short time for questions i have a question yeah, sorry. Uh, so if I understand correctly, your method consists in inverting the noisy image uh, through the inverse uh, 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 a mapping T and then uh, fitting the inverse. So in a, it, you're inverting the noise in a way, right? So if your image is like the, the true uh, output plus noise, you're inverting the noise. And then you're hoping that I guess this is not going to totally blow up with the inverse. Uh, so I was wondering, I mean, uh, something that I would probably have tried first is to maybe, so you, you say it's unsupervised, but you still have uncoupled data to actually learn the manifold of what real images actually look like, right? So how about learning a uh, GAN that tells you how to uh, generate uh, real images and then, uh, and then uh, uh, do the fitting in the uh, image space of the GAN with the noise that's not inverted? Is that something you tried? No, but that's something actually that others tried, right? So there are these, um, uh, now the, the name escapes me, but there are these, uh, these, uh, these gun based, uh, maybe they're even called, Yusuf, you're nodding. Do you, do you remember how they're called? Uh, yeah, there's some gun based fire, I forget exactly, but yeah. So. Yeah, but, but there are people who have been doing this. The, the important thing here uh, is though, Philippe, that we are not starting with an image, right? So we are starting with the data and then we, from the data, uh, we, okay, so that, that has a particular noise distribution and then we apply the pseudo inverse and that surely changes the noise distribution, I totally agree. Um, but that again is only tra it, uh, used for creating this training distribution of these images that should be avoided. So it's not, uh, so in that sense, it's not uh, used in the end in solving the inverse problem because that's again one with a discrepancy term and the regularizer. It's it's used to to set up the regularizer. Okay. So that's true, but I don't I don't quite know. I mean, you could yeah, you could maybe without having this this uh, bad distribution. I don't know, you, you would need to find another way how to create uh, a distribution that mimics the type of reconstructions you, don't, you want to avoid. Because these are, anyway, these are the ones that are fed to the regularizer, right? The regularizer will only see the ones with the inverted noise, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because the noise in image space is different to the noise in, in uh, measurement space. Depending again on the transform, if that's really true, but yeah, usually it's true. Okay. Does it does it make sense? Yeah. Uh, we actually have a question in the chat. Do you want to handle it, uh, Yusuf, or do you want me to? Sure. Yeah. Carla, so, so I'll read it so everyone can see it. Um, what are the practical trade-offs between dataset dependent and dataset free? e.g. deep decoder methods in particular, when is it realistic to assume access to a large representative data set even unlabeled if you're imaging something new or unknown? Yeah, so that's right. So the thing is for supervised methods, people are trying to understand generalizability actually, but for unsupervised, this is not so easy. So there is not so much. It would be very interesting to look at this uh, also, uh, also theoretically, but I'm not aware that there is much. So actually, 
the answer is I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a question. I guess you kind of alluded to this at the end, but is, has there been much work now in interpreting, say, these learned regularizers, maybe even the convex ones, because that seems potentially easier, as you know, Gibbs distributions? I mean, is is there been much work in understanding now? Okay, if I, if I kind of lift this to a to a probability distribution, what it's really trying to do or what its structure yeah, might be. Yeah, I mean, we should do this more, but at least the convex regularizer is set up as the negative log of a distribution. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but we haven't really looked at this yet. One thing we actually wanted to do, or that Shubo started together with Marcelo Pereira in Edinburgh, is to, um, so Marcelo has this way of doing uncertainty quantification with, uh, with uh, this prox type methods. He combines convex analysis with, with MCMC kind of stuff. I, I, I don't know enough about uncertainty quantification to be honest to explain this uh, properly, but they have started to look into this for the, for the convex adversarial regularizer, which maybe gives some idea uh, of what it is doing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So are there any other questions? Or... Okay, well, let's, uh, let's thank uh, Carla again for a really nice talk. Thanks again. Thank you, Yosef. Thank you.